Major funding for this program was provided by the Wheeling National Heritage Area Corporation and funded in part by the National Park Service, U.S. Department of the Interior. Wheeling National Heritage Area Corporation leads community efforts to recognize, communicate, and preserve Wheeling's heritage. Additional support was provided by the Shank Charitable Trust and the Community Foundation for the Ohio Valley. This was the last class to graduate from a school founded in 1848 in an America vastly different from today. The rise of industrialization had a profound impact upon American society in the 19th century. This new industrial economy was creating more wealth in America and in turn contributing to a rapidly growing middle class. There was an increasing need for a literate workforce and educated people to fuel economic growth from the factory floor through the levels of management. Wheeling, in 1848, was a thriving place and was well situated between Pittsburgh and Cincinnati on the Ohio River. With the arrival of the National Road in 1818, combined with existing river transport, the city was perfectly positioned to develop as a commercial and industrial center. However, Western Virginia was a region lacking in schools. You're not going to find a very well-established public education system. The state of Virginia was not providing public education. It was almost like a county option, and often counties refused to do that because those folks who had money, the, the, the uh, plantation owners in the eastern part of the state or business owners in places like Wheeling, they could afford to send their children to private schools or to have private tutors. With the city's expansion through industrial development came an increase in the number of wealthy and middle-class families who wanted and could afford a quality education for their daughters. There were nearby boarding schools that did receive female students, but the closest, West Liberty Academy, was at a distance of 12 miles and only reached over difficult roads. It was an evangelical Christianity that next stepped onto the stage. Richard Vincent Whalen, Bishop of Richmond, Virginia, called upon the Sisters from the Order of the Visitation in Baltimore to establish a school in Wheeling. Dear Sister, I have just received the Archbishop's letter giving the names of the Wheeling Colony. I am delighted to hear of their pious and cheerful resignation to the call of Providence, and beg of you to present to them in my name a Father's blessing. I enclose the little notice which I introduced in Monday's paper. You will observe that your school is announced to open on the 10th of April. I was induced to make this announcement partly to gratify some who have long been expecting the opening of the school. Your school is quite an exciting topic of conversation in many circles, and your coming is anxiously expected. Most sincerely yours, Richard Vincent, Bishop of Richmond. A house on the corner of Oaf and 14th Streets was purchased to serve as the site of the new Wheeling Female Academy 
and as residence for the sisters. The sisters traveled from Baltimore to the western end of the rail line. There they transferred to a stagecoach for the remainder of the journey to Wheeling. The Visitation Sisters who traveled from Baltimore to Wheeling in the mid-19th century um, first went by train to Harper's Ferry and then by stagecoach um, across National Road. Um, those women wore their street clothes as opposed to uh, their habit uh, because of general anti-Catholicism, a certain amount of animosity. Um, we don't have evidence of, of you know, bona fide um, attacks uh, against women religious, but that kind of practice wearing their street clothes when they're traveling long distances um, is, is quite common during this time period. In anticipation of the new school, a prospectus appeared in the local paper. It provided details and the appropriate encouragements for families to enroll their daughters in a school offering a quality education. While the cost of an academy education for young girls was not cheap, it was affordable. The cost advantage continued to drive an increase in enrollments through the 1850s, and academy education was particularly attractive to many families in other southern states. Another factor in the early success was the very nature of the school. The staff and teachers were nuns. At this time, a parochial school made for a more stable school less likely to close during times of financial stress. Protestants um, often sought out um, this type of an education, particularly for daughters. Um, I th that, that primarily is because of a limited number of options. Um, in the mid-19th century, there aren't many educational opportunities for teenage girls, uh, and so women religious are providing um, a service that, that quite frankly no one else is providing at the time. So there's a, there's a, there's a willingness. Um, it is, it's remarkable, particularly when you, when you familiarize yourself with the hostility toward Catholics in, in the mid-19th century. So I think there is a certain, you know, sort of irony um, in that, you know, Protestants are, are willingly, you know, sending their daughters, um, you know, to these, to these schools. The Academy was experiencing the growing pains associated with its success. Lack of space was becoming a problem. So in 1865, Bishop Whalen purchased the Steenrod Farm, east of the city, for $30,000, where a new convent and school were to be constructed. In the post-Civil War years, sufficient materials and funds were not always available, so the construction evolved. High rail fences gave way to hedges, trees were planted, and the grounds around the building were improved and given a measure of landscaping to complement the nature of the undertakings within. The new building was massive, an impressive addition to the rural landscape. No longer the Wheeling Female Academy, it was now the Mount de Chantal Visitation Academy, in honor of St. Jane de Chantal, the co-founder of the Order of the Visitation. Students entering through the Academy gate were greeted by the vision of an idyllic place. As one patron stated, it is beyond the city's din, where beauty and healthfulness can scarcely be surpassed. With the new school came a new problem. The war had been devastating for the South, and many Southern families now found themselves unable to afford to send their daughters to the Mount. The school responded in 1866 by establishing what was called the Southern Fund to provide financial assistance to the daughters of reduced Southern families who have lost all by the late war. At one point, Sisters of the Visitation journeyed to New York and called upon one William M. Tweed to help secure donations. Boss Tweed provided a list of his friends and associates who he indicated would volunteer to make donations. The trip was successful. The reform-minded Horace Greeley, founder and editor of the New York Tribune, met with the sisters on one of their trips to New York. I am so much occupied that I do not see how I can call at 19 West 34th Street this week. But if the ladies will call on Saturday at 4 to 5 p.m., 
say at 5, at my lodgings, Westmoreland Hotel, corner of 4th Avenue and 17th Street, Union Square, I shall be happy to meet them. Support for the Mount came from many directions. In a brief letter to the sisters, Robert E. Lee expressed his support of their work. No greater benefit can be conferred upon a country than the proper education of its children, and those who help promote this object are well deserving of its gratitude. As the school continued into the late 19th century, it flourished. An expanding academic program adapted to the changing times with more courses in the sciences, mathematics, history, and geography. Meticulous and artful detail in student work is an example of how young women attending the Mount were receiving a well-balanced education that went beyond the conventions of the time. Even in geography classes, map drawing was included as a way to solidify their knowledge of world geography. Outside of the classroom, students enjoyed the expansive grounds. Extracurricular life for the students was rich with opportunity. The school would produce elaborate plays and operas and became an extension of the view that the education of women needed to support the development of the whole person. In a changing society, sports also found a place at the Mount, a feature of Mount life that would continue to grow in the 20th century. As the school grew, so did the convent. At its height, the Mount de Chantal convent was home to more than 50 sisters who maintained a well-ordered community and home. The institution maintained a degree of self-sufficiency. This included growing food for the school and convent in the gardens, and maintaining sheep and dairy cattle as part of the farming operations. The farm ceased operations in the mid-20th century, when the property that would become Wheeling Jesuit University was sold. The sisters were a cloistered order, so contact with the outside world was very limited. The facility had a large kitchen in which to prepare daily meals for the sisters and students. A laundry kept the clothing clean and crisp. At one time, the mount even generated its own electricity, a practice not uncommon in the late 19th century, before a national power grid existed. Until the mid-20th century, the sisters divided tasks according to a rank. Choir and associate sisters were responsible for the administration of the school and convent and teaching classes. Housekeeping duties were assigned to lay sisters. The nuns maintained a very simple lifestyle. The rooms in which they lived and worked were simple and sparsely furnished. Public areas, such as parlors, classrooms, and other school facilities, were well equipped. Gratings along the side of the chapel and parlors marked the division between public and cloistered areas. The cloister ended with Vatican II in the 1960s, and the sisters made the choice to no longer wear the traditional habits and to have contact with the public. Central to the education and life of the students and sisters was the inspiration provided by the building itself. Most prominent was the chapel. A magnificent altar dominated the front of the chapel. Rising almost two stories, it was adorned with religious artwork. Two statues represent the founders of the Order of the Visitation, St. Francis de Sales and St. Jane Francis de Chantal. At the rear of the chapel sat a large, Hook Company pipe organ. In continuous use since 1867, at the hands of a skilled organist, it was the source of inspirational music that filled the chapel and beyond. Sunlight streamed into the chapel through the stained glass windows. In a style dating back to the Middle Ages, each window represented part of the story of Christianity and the founding of the Order of the Visitation. Tall, ornate columns extended to support the vaulted ceiling. 
Perhaps the most impressive feature was the central dome. With its high, arched, stained glass panels, it seemed to suspend an almost dreamlike umbrella of color and light above the altar. In all, the chapel provided a center for the religious life of the mount. It also offered a place of solitude for reflection, surrounded by an artfully crafted environment of architectural splendor. In the main building, a grand hall ran the entire length of the right wing on the second floor. At the end of the hall was a stage that was used for presentations, plays, and musical performances. Two matched Steinway grand pianos completed the hall and were available to students and faculty. The quality of a Mount experience was never in doubt. Student recitals were part of the rich legacy of refinement in a young woman's education. In the center was a large, ornate glass chandelier, manufactured locally by the Hobbs Procunior Company. In 1906, a new building was added. It was to provide a new home for music and art. From its early years, the Academy enjoyed a reputation for excellence in music education. Practice rooms were numerous, and each was provided with a piano. Vocal as well as instrumental studies were encouraged. The original art studio, a place of creativity, occupied space in the main building. The upper level of the new building became the art studio. It was designed to provide the most advantageous setting for the student artist. Large skylights bathed the room in a soft, natural light, providing an almost perfect illumination in any part of the studio. This is my torso. I did it my sophomore year. It's, um, well, everyone does a t torso their sophomore year, and it's supposed to represent who they are, it's um, a self-portrait. And I did mine on faith, because freshman and sophomore year were very trying times for me. I just, I grew a lot in my faith. So it represents that. There's different things, cutouts from it, um, poems, um, I painted some on it. And the wings are just to represent like taking flight. Once you get somewhere where you don't know what to do, you can just take that first step and like go places and that's what the wings represent to me. It took a long time to find the wings. I had to um, actually order them, especially because no one sells wings. But um, there's lots of stuff on it. They just mean like different things. The butterflies on the side represent, um, I'm involved in a youth organization and one of their symbols is the butterfly. It's like bursting forth, and um, well, there's just different verses, things that mean things that are valuable to me, so most of it's just sentimental. Throughout the years, the academy was both a day and boarding school. The school could comfortably house up to 120 students. Three large dormitories were divided into individual alcoves. They were separated by simple wooden frames and white muslin curtains and equipped with a washstand, chair, storage box, and mirror. As the decades progressed, the dormitories gave way to individual rooms, which were more comfortable and offered students more opportunities to personalize the space to suit their own tastes. A variety of facilities were available and part of daily life. A large dining hall could easily seat 100 students at a time. <laughs> the basement floor served as a gym for athletic and recreational needs until a new gym building was constructed. A library was a well-ordered and well-used location. The curriculum, while maintaining excellence in the arts, gained attention in mathematics and science. Regardless of the era, 
the Mount continued in its excellence to educate young women. You're, as I said, you're confident in yourself. You're confident in uh, what you're thinking and in what you're doing. You know that you can do what you need to do and that your thoughts and your opinions are valid. You're not seeking the approval of anyone. You're not seeking the approval of um, male classmates or, um, or friends with whom you're competing for the attention of male classmates. Developing your own voice, I think, has always been a major component of a Mount education. And in some ways, it's simply a necessity. If you're in class with six people, say, there's really not much room for, for a student to remain silent. Um, but it's never that speaking up, speaking out um, is forced, but it is encouraged. And in a supportive, small, caring environment, I think girls really feel free to voice their opinions. And in some cases, it may take longer to find that voice than in other cases, but that's not the issue. The issue is that by the time you walk out the Mount doors for the last time, you can hear your own voice and you can share that voice with other people. One of the long-standing traditions of life at the Mount was the May Party, a combination celebration of the arrival of spring and summer and a chance for the outgoing class and the juniors anticipating their senior year to have some fun. Elaborate ceremonies with fine attire and all the necessary pomp and circumstance were the hallmarks of the May Party for generations. It was not just a tradition, it was a rite of passage. The May Parties were glamorous displays, worthy of young girls becoming young women. In more recent times, the style became less formal and more relaxed, though the importance of the tradition was never lost. With the Mount's reputation for both academic quality and an environment of positive values, it became an important educational option in the community. As generations passed, the All Girls Academy expanded to include opportunities for young children. In 1970, the Mount opened its Montessori school for preschool and elementary education. You know, I, I think the Mount's reputation and its role in the community was really larger than the number of people who ever went through its doors. You know, the, the influence there um, was, I, I think, unusual in the respect that, you know, you may only have a hundred uh, girls at a time who go to the school. Many of those folks aren't even from Wheeling. But the community knew that they had within their midst a quality educational experience. And that I think having a school like that makes you a better community. It says something about your community that, hey, you folks understand what makes a, a community work. Education, uh, some kind of structure, um, and, and the kinds of training you know, to prepare you for the future. And I think that's what the Mount did, and I think they did it well. Life outside of the school was also changing, and with the decrease in the Wheeling area population, available public and other private schools, the enrollment of the Mount reached a point where it could no longer stay open. In early 2008, it was announced that the school would close after 160 years. It was clearly recognized as something special. This was not a school like any other. It was quite clear that at the Mount there were students who were, out of a cross-section of students, there were students there who were um, exceeding all expectations. 
a place where dreams were nurtured, passions were fed. Um, it's um, really quite hard to put into words, but I think if you had asked anybody in the larger community, they would say, oh, the Mount's an important part of who, who this community has been and continues to be right up until the time that the Mount ceased its existence. 160 years. During that time, 33 U.S. presidents took office. Students were in the classroom during the time of the California Gold Rush, and 21 states were admitted to the Union. Movies, radio, television, and computers were all invented. Walt Whitman wrote Leaves of Grass, and Mark Twain entertained us with wit and wisdom. And generations of young women experienced a place of learning, leadership, and achievement, their lives to be forever changed.